Halloween approaches and I decided to treat you to the sweet cheese that is Night of the Comet. A film directed by Tom Eberhardt with lady leads Catherine Mary Stewart and Kelly Maroney. This is another film that my mom decided to show me in my formative years, but thankfully, it taught me to be afraid of sensible things like zombies and abandoned malls. This tasty 80s movie mixes zombies with vampires to create an unholy monster medley that can have supervillain levels of plotting. So pull up your space pants and let's get tubular. Our film opens with some delightfully engaging and relevant narration. Since before recorded time. And then it... That its very existence remained a secret. And... The visitor was returning. Next week, the citizens of Earth would get an extra Christmas present this year. Indeed, not since the time that the dinosaurs disappeared. There were a few who saw this as more than just a coincidence. But most didn't. <clears throat> but there's another small group of people who are celebrating the event because it's completely safe. We then come across a movie theater that's sibling as a doodly pop store that sells only the highest quality doodlies. This is the best we have. This is nine fifty. Wait, this is eight. This is seven fifty. After that very necessary price comparison scene, we get to see the first recorded sighting of a girl playing video games. But she isn't just any girl. She's Regina, and she don't take no guff, especially in a movie theater that seems to cater to a pretty tough clientele. Aw, oh, Mel, they throw things at me. Have you ever been hit with dots, Mel? Milk dots? Those things hurt. When her boss tries to get her to clean out the theater, she can't pull herself away because she has a very reasonable, obsessive compulsion to have her name next to every score on the board. Bridge. Third place. Wait a minute. Somebody named DMK in sixth place? When did this happen? After bribing her with popcorn, the boss man convinces Regina to do her job, but she instead decides to go visit her friend in the projection booth, who's a very shrewd businessman. Let me take this for you. Uh, 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 think I'm gonna miss this comet thing for a lousy hundred dollars? Okay, one ten's a little better, yeah. While he's on the phone, she asks if he knows the identity of the person who took her sixth place score. Lara, do you know anybody named DMK? No. When he can't help her hunt down her nemesis, Regina wants to go see the comet, but he wants to stay in the booth and wait for a customer, because it's not like they can wait outside and come back in after his important business deal. Despite the perfectly safe once-in-a-lifetime event outside, Regina decides to spend the night in the projection booth with Larry for a hefty compensatory sum of $15. So what do you say, I'll give you $15? Are you kidding? We spend the night in here, we end up making it, and you give me 15 bucks? I mean, you'd be worth a lot more than 15 bucks. We then get to meet Regina's sister, Samantha, all of a sudden. And based on her choice of garb, we can tell she's very active. Expected to begin at, at 2.04. Regina asks her sister to lie for her to their stepmother, who's upset that she'll be missing the very important formal doodly pop party she's throwing. Look, I need your help. Tell her that you know all about this field trip that I'm going to take. <sighs> She's gonna be out all night with her science class at the observatory. If you wanna watch the comet, you can do it here. Samantha expresses her issues with some of the people on the guest list, and her stepmother gives her a good reason for having invited them. Join the party for what, Doris? So I can watch Chuck from across the street stick his hands down your pants? Chuck's a nice guy. You were born with an asshole, Doris. You don't need Chuck. Her stepmother reacts with the maturity and understanding you can expect from a nurturing mother figure. Like a, a, a... We catch up with Regina again and find that she decided to have a sleepover with her friend in the projection booth. And just like most boy-girl sleepovers, they fall into a discussion about architectural integrity. Not these walls are made out of steel. It used to be a fire law. Back at the party, we see that the comet flying by isn't cause for alarm at all. Unfortunately, the comet was actually emitting Kool-Aid waves and has turned the skies to tropical punch and the people into piles of cherry powder mix. Thankfully, the automotive clowns have been left untarnished. Back in the projection booth, we see that Larry was stood up by his customer, and Regina is peeved that she stayed at his sleepover without even being compensated. If he screwed that film up, we could all be in a lot of trouble. I'm gonna go over there on the bike. Aw, oh, jeez, don't I get an egg with muffin or anything? I'm very, 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 very pissed. And what about my 15 bucks? Tell him you're pissed too. 
After he leaves, she does the only thing a reasonable person would do and goes back to obsessing over who took the sixth place spot on the scoreboard. DMK. As Larry exits the building, he finds out his customer didn't like to be kept waiting. Oh, is that you? Yeah, it's about friggin' time. While this is happening, Regina is busy setting things right. Yeah! It's in you, DMK. Your history. After re-establishing the natural order, she goes outside and doesn't question why it seemed to have rained clothes and Kool-Aid overnight. She accidentally locks herself out of the theater, so she goes back to the alley to see if she can get in through the back door. Oh. She finds Larry's keys, but when there's no sign of him, she heads for his motorcycle where she gets ambushed by a zombie with questionable <laughs> fashion choices. Is this trick or treat? After declining his invitation to approach, she sensibly tosses the keys to her only escape vehicle. Come here! Come here! Come here, your ass. This was a smart and considerate move because he might have stolen the bike if he nabbed the keys, or even worse, she could have cut up his face if she hit him with those things. Luckily, her video game experience has made her proficient in melee attacks and she grabs the keys after winning the fight. As she drives down the highway, we see that the roads are empty despite the fact that the Kool-Aid Comet didn't seem to have an effect on motor vehicles. After arriving home, Regina realizes that everyone outside was turned into Kool-Aid mix, but she finds Samantha still has all her people parts and the two talk about what happened to everyone outside. Samantha? What? <laughs> so I spent the night in the lawn storage shed. I swear to God! <laughs> they swallowed my gum. There's nobody! I mean, there's nobody! I'll show you Doris! Here's Doris! Samantha reacts well to the news. On the radio, they hear the disc jockey talking about the playlist for the weekend and believe that there must be survivors at the radio station. Don't forget, we preview the top 20 every Friday night. A great way to start a super weekend here in the Southland. Get down! Unfortunately, the Kool-Aid Acalypse has even claimed the entertainment industry and we find that the voice they've been hearing was pre-recorded. So where is he? We got trouble, not us. That's the name of the song, and I'm Steve LeBeau, trapped inside your radio, the guy who really cares about you. As it happens, they weren't the only ones hoping to find survivors at the station and are humbly approached by another person looking for answers. Hold it right there. You, the blonde, get into the light. But Samantha isn't having any of this business and intimidates him into submission with her snarky tood. Five, four, three. Okay, okay. Did you get a lot of dates this way? Open your eyes. Okay. Our discount Eric Estrada tells the sisters about his earlier run-ins with the Zompires, but Samantha interrupts him. Well, you got off lucky. Me and this girl pulled into town this morning. You don't work here? No, I drive a truck. That's when we spotted one of those whatever they are. This girl freaked out. Took off running. I spotted her about 20 minutes later. Looked like one of those things had what? torn her apart. His story confirms Regina's suspicions that Larry was torn apart for his sweet meats by the monster man in the alley. Oh, God. Larry. The guy she knew? The same thing might have happened. Feeling sick, she rushes off to the bathroom, and Hector does his best to console her. Listen, this is no time for an attitude problem. Your little sister seems to be taking this a lot better than you. That's because she doesn't know what's going on. She thinks we're going to be rescued. She could be right. Give us a break, Hector. 
After showing appreciation for Hector's compassion, Regina tries to figure out how they all managed to keep from becoming zompires. Where'd you spend the night last night? In the back of my truck with the girl I picked up. Steel's gotta be the answer. Meanwhile, Samantha tries to call someone with the radio station. Hey, is anybody there? Back in the bathroom, Regina criticizes their only weapon while demonstrating her progressive views about the Hispanic community. Where'd you get this a dime store? Might be all right for date night in the barrio, but if we want to get any more of those guys outside, we're going to need a little more stopping power. We check in with Samantha again, who's learned what radio stations are really for, establishing a new law and order. Legal drinking age is now 10, but you will need ID, let's be real. But it turns out that her new laws have attracted attention, and someone calls in. I got a call. Hello? Thanks to a close-up of the microphone, we can tell that their discussion is being overheard and we're transported to a lab where scientists are trying to figure out what to do about the small group of survivors. I don't know. They said they were like part of a think tank. Did they mention a town? Well, if they'll stay put, we can get them. I'm opposed to this. There's no reason for us to bring those people back here. After this, we get to hear a more detailed description of what's happening to people who are only slightly exposed to the comet from the person with the most knowledge and experience on the subject, Samantha. What happened to Doris is happening to them, only slower. They're dangerous, like what happened to Larry. Next, we see that she's somehow got a change of clothes and is behaving like a true lawmaker and speeding down the highway under the influence of alcohol. Some police officers see her speeding and chase her down. But it turns out they were jerky vampires who weren't going to give her a ticket at all. I know you guys are probably going to give me a ticket or something, but... But this was just a nightmare. <gasps> she goes to the bathroom to bathe in the sink when she's attacked by another <laughs> officer jerky face. But this was just another nightmare that she calmly wakes up from. <laughs> After having been woken up by Samantha, Regina helps her relax, but quickly leaves her alone again so she can go chat with Hector. Sammy, Sammy, it's on the train. Is she okay? Yeah. During their talk time, he tells her he's going back home old San Diego way to visit his family, and she offers an encouraging reply. I have to go to San Diego tomorrow. Why? My mom. Some friends, my sister. But you know they're gone. As they discuss their plans for Hector's return, we see that Samantha has... A suspicious itch. To get her mind off things, Samantha goes outside to repair a car. See, this is the problem with these things. Daddy would have gotten us Uzis. She then explains that the reason behind her bad attitude is because Regina is a filthy boy swiper. My sister, who swiped every guy I ever had my eye on, has now swiped the last guy in the whole freaked out world. The two share a laugh over Samantha's honesty, but quickly remember that there's nothing funny about this. <laughs> when Hector arrives home, he's encouraged to run in by the jaunty sounds of a record player. Mom! Just when he starts to mourn his mama and loot the house, he's accosted by... A persistent <laughs> zombie boy! <laughs> A chase ensues, bringing the film's tension to an all-new high. Shit! Back in the city, we see that Regina has swiped a few more things, and Samantha comes clean about her suspicious itch. It's about the 12th can you've down this morning. Yeah, well, what are you going to do when your complexion freaks up? I know, and I'm getting a rash or something, too. Samantha then warns her friends, but Regina doesn't have time for all that noise because of more important things. Kathy. She was flunking algebra, and she was trying to figure out some way to keep her parents from finding out. <laughs> the stars are open! 
we then get what every horror movie is missing. A shopping montage! But while the girls are having fun, we see that some super creeps have been watching them. All right, let's do it. But before they can ambush the sisters, Samantha has a theory that she eloquently presents to Regina. What if Hector's got the same problem we have? No guys. I mean, what if Hector's gay? So that means that the last guy on Earth is either a gentleman or a fag. Unfortunately, the girls left one of their guns where the creeps can steal them. So Samantha uses the next best thing to attack their assailants. While she reloads, Regina uses a classic Scooby-Doo strategy to get a jump on the creeps. Whoa! Samantha uses a melee attack to take down one attacker and follows up with a sportsman-like taunt. Hi. <clears throat> but she's captured by the enemy and is used as bait for Regina. She tries the same tactics on the king creep, but he instead chooses to downsize his kingdom. I'm gonna ice bachelorette number two. Even if you pull the trigger, I can still take him out. And you. Come on, Willie, she means it. I can't have you holding one of my people hostage. When Samantha asks what they want from them, King Creep offers a very straightforward answer. Coming in here and ripping us off! What do you want? You wouldn't believe what we want from you. In your worst nightmare, you wouldn't believe. He starts to play a fun game with them, but the scientists come in at the last minute and interrupt. Let's play a game. It's called Scary Noises. Isn't that a scary noise? After saving them, the scientist leaves Samantha behind because of her suspicious itch. Scientist Sassy Pants gives Samantha a questionable injection, but Samantha trusts her because she's like a total genius. Your skin's been a little irritated. I always get rashes, but if I do have that stuff, this will get rid of it, right? Yeah. Just a pinch now. You guys are like geniuses, right? Yeah, I thought so. We have a couple of geniuses at my school. They're both wimps. Scientist Sassy Pants feels bad about tricking her and tries to avoid waiting for Hector, but her quirky cohort isn't on the same page. When he seductively reaches for his gun, she puts him at ease only to pull off a sassalicious double cross. You were right about the condition being progressive. We have maybe hours. We have a commitment. I don't have enough to debate the issue. I am not going to be a party to taking anybody else. You have to live up to it. What do you expect me to do, Oscar? Go for my gun? Of course not. Hector returns in a festive costume, ready to surprise the girls with gifts he picked up from his fun family road trip. But he gets a surprise instead. Reggie! Merry Christmas! Hi. Scientist Sassy Pants tells Hector what's going on back at the lab and how the other scientists got infected. I'm gonna miss Christmas permanently. I thought they were talking hypothetically until they found the first survivors. And they really did it. Some of those survivors were just kids. Hey, wait a minute. What's all this about blood? They think they can generate a serum. We were exposed. They left the ventilating ducts wide open, fans going. Very scientific. Very stupid. In 36 hours, you will be able to vacuum up the last of them from the carpet. Santa Claus. Before going on, let's be spelunkers and make our way down the plot hole. The Kool-Aid Comet passes by Earth, turning everyone outside into fruit punch mix. Those of whom had some shelter managed to avoid this, but turned into jerky-faced vampires and eventually into Kool-Aid mix. However, if you were in a shelter made of steel, you avoided jerky faceification and were totally fine. But according to the scientists, they're turning into zompires because they left the vents open to their facility. A facility they spent years making in preparation for the comet. And you mean to tell me somebody left the vents open? If that's the case, then how is it that Hector and Regina were unaffected? The theater wasn't airtight and presumably had a functioning ventilation system. And Hector's truck couldn't have been airtight either. So what gives, movie? What gives?
Back at the lab, Regina is focused on an interview. Have you ever had hepatitis? Go for scissors. When she starts asking questions about Samantha's whereabouts, he compassionately replies, Where's my sister? Your sister's dead. After this, we see Scientist Turtleneck arguing with Scientist Turtleneck Jr. like a normal person. You're going to have to start with the children and that one in there. We need blood to develop the serum. We're not robots, Doctor. We're not all going to fall over at one time. You're smart. You can figure that out. Psychology's not an exact science. Oh my God, man, anybody can answer too. Scientist Turtleneck Jr. comes in to try to console Regina, but when he gives her guff about destroying inanimate objects, she decides to destroy animate ones. I'm very sorry about your sister. It's a tragedy. And I can understand your hostility, but no matter how upset you are, breaking an expensive piece of equipment won't solve anything. To be able to realize that. Also having been inspired by Scooby and the gang, Hector arrives at the lab in disguise, managing to expertly fool one of the guards. This lady back in L.A. sent me. You like girls? See, this lady shot her up with sodium pentothal to make this fella think she was dead. <laughs> <laughs> After Samantha shuts off the power of the facility, Regina is able to get free and goes to rescue the kids who are thankfully too suspicious of the scientists to fall for their super convincing tricks. What are you guys doing? They said if we breathe this, we could go to the North Pole and see Santa Claus. During the rescue, she's surprised by Samantha and can hardly keep the joy of seeing her sister alive contained. Hey! Ah! They said you were dead! Hey, that's a great outfit. When Scientist Turtleneck sees how much fun the other two scientists are having thanks to Regina, his rage intensifies and he is determined to get her back in custody. <laughs> get everybody topside. Now! But she's headed topside with Samantha and the kids, whom she's very nice to. Put your hands down, kids. God, don't be so stupid. Hector picks them up after having rigged up a special little something for the scientists. And during the getaway, Regina bonds some more with the kids. I'm Brian. I'm Sarah. Yeah, and I'm Aunt Rich. And that's Aunt Sam. That's Uncle Hector. Can I have my bunny? In a minute. Hey, it's my bunny, you know. I'm not kidding. I get car sick without my bunny. Come on, Rich. Give the kid the bunny. Turtleneck Jr. suspects that something's up, but scientist Turtleneck is really tired and doesn't have time for his suspicions. Is that gasoline I smell? Wait, wait, don't, don't! As the group is distracted by the Zompire barbecue, a freshly jerky-faced scientist grabs the little girl, but Hector quickly solves the problem by turning his face into Swiss cheese instead. After their successful escape, a cleansing rain comes, finally making Kool-Aid out of the powder mix. <laughs> Having become a family man, Hector throws away his guns, but his adopted daughter is upset that she won't be getting those sweet hand-me-downs. can't tell on these things. Hey, if you're gonna throw those guns away, can I have one? When she sees Regina and the others refusing to cross against the traffic light, Samantha gets fed up and reminds them that she's the new ruler of law now, resulting in her nearly paying a hefty price. Are you nuts? The whole burden of civilization has fallen upon us. That's totally stupid! Being a stand-up fella, the driver of the car apologizes to Samantha before he's even sure she's not a zompire. God, I'm sorry, but you shouldn't cross against the light like that. Hey, you guys are survivors too, huh? Samantha is happy to find a boy that Regina hasn't swiped and rides off with him. Great car. Thanks, I have 23 of them. You want to go for a ride? What's your name? Danny Mason Keener. It's here that we find out that the stranger is Regina's greatest rival from the beginning of the film. <laughs> but she doesn't notice, and we end the film with a game of Suit Street Football. And 
that was Night of the Comet, an educational sci-fi thriller that illustrates how playing video games can help you survive the apocalypse. This film was weird. The science behind the zompires is pretty inconsistent. It's unclear what kinds of enclosures keep you from getting infected, and the characters seem more concerned about finding new costumes for their Scooby-Doo tactics than they do about surviving, despite the fact that they're probably going to run out of beer soon, which seems to be the only thing they've been using to sustain themselves. But for all its faults, I have to admit that I like this movie. It features two capable female leads, which is rare even by today's standards, even if one of them is a racist who steals from children. Anyway, I hope this was as much a treat for you as it was for me to review. Happy Halloween! Muffy? Stupid dog.